You clearly don't know who you're talking to. So let me clue you in. I am not in danger, Skyler. I am the danger. A guy opens his door and gets shot, and you think that of me? No. I am the one who knocks. I am Lou Diamond. Would you like to learn from those that are taking their lives, their businesses, and their passions to the next level? Best-selling author of Speak Easy and master connector Lou Diamond is here to connect you to some of the most inspiring and amazing people on this planet. Get ready to thrive loud with Lou Diamond. Welcome, everyone, to another spectacular, fantabulous, absolutely awesome episode of Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond, connecting you to the most inspiring and amazing people that are thriving each and every day. I'm your host, Lou Diamond. Oh, my goodness. Today on Thrive Loud, we have the CEO and founder of Reach Out Technology and has become a nationally recognized voice on cybersecurity, business, and entrepreneurship. This gentleman takes cybersecurity to a whole new level with his transformative approach using a combination of CIA training, criminal psychology, and his technology and business experience, saving businesses over $400 million over the last 10 years. Pretty impressive. He hosts the All In Podcast. He looks damn good with a cool purple background coming to us from just outside of Chicago. Thrive Lab listeners, Rick Jordan. Rick, how are you today? What's shaking, Lou? Thanks for having me, man. I, 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 there's like so many things I like about who you are just from the description of you. You've got some CIA training, you've got some cyber security, you've got an entrepreneurial spirit, and you got like black and purple going on there, which is, by the way, um, the, those who are watching the video of this episode will notice there was a memo today. Um, he got it, black t-shirt. I forgot to comb my hair, so I put on a hat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the memo, yeah. Exactly. I'm in a black t-shirt every single day of my life, man. That's uh, that's how I roll. You know, I Just, go on stage. Yeah. I go on TV and they, they love it. Like all these guys show up in suits, you know, and then here's Rick who walks on the set of News Nation, you know, which I'm going to be on with Chris Cuomo coming up here, too, because that's where his new show landed. But awesome. I'll be like this, brother, just in a black T-shirt talking about cyber, talking about business, talking about just life, everything. It's awesome. We're, by the way, a big fan of uh, News Nation because uh, Adrian Bankert has been a guest on the show. She hosts the morning oh, cool. show. She's and, great. Yeah, uh, I've been on yeah, with her a couple of times. She's been a guest and she um she actually she and I are on our my audio book together at the back end of the book section. So we had a lot of fun together. She's That's fantastic. She's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think the last right. segment I did with her had to do with Twitch and the live streamed shootings. If I remember oh, right on the morning show. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that was interesting because I mean, I mean, I'm in tech. Right. And Twitch, obviously, I was like, that was really freaking fast that they got it down within two minutes, like crazy quick. Yeah. And then every other media platform after that was struggling. But I went into it. She goes, well, well, how could this have been stopped? I'm like, well, maybe with the with the school officials when this dude was a teenager because mm -hmm. he showed some behavioral troubles years ago. You mm -hmm. know, the, this isn't necessarily a big tech problem. That's not where it started. Right. That's so true. A lot of individual issues there anyway. Yeah. All right. This is what I want to do for our listeners here, Rick. I want to do like the quick rewind. I don't want to go all the way to the womb. I want to go back and understand how, how reach out technology specifically became your gig kind of like bring everyone up to speed and then we'll dive into that sound like a plan yeah i dig it yeah so how did bit. it kick off so what was so were, were you in the military were you in the cia Give me i was the never background. in the cia yeah it's a, the as CIA, far as i know i know right yeah exactly <laughs> i was trained by uh he was called is called the legend right he's the individual who trained still half the active case operators in the world and when i say case operators are co's which means in essence spies right yeah. the, those are the the undercover that like that's you think cia that's who you would think of like who you would envision in your mind is a is a co a case operator walking around doing the the clandestine stuff uh, that was when i had a uh i had a private security agency uh, a few years back i mean i'm talking like guns and guards you yeah. know high level asset protection when i say high level assets i'm talking both people like like celebrities and also things like diamonds, right? The, those types of things. And the CIA training came through that period of my life when I had that business. But prior to that, I mean, if you take it way back, you know, my first career path was going to be a cop. 
Uh, I was going to join the military as a as an MP in the Marines when I was 18. And I had a medical history of asthma from when I was like four. So they didn't take me, you know, mm. and I'm like, fine, whatever. I was a police cadet, all that. And then I just kind of shifted into tech. It just sort of it's weird because it sort of happened that way. However, when I say it sort of happened, I had a, a dude who was kind of like a big brother to me when I was really young. You know, so at 10 years old, I built my first computer. And wow. this was before computers were really cool because you're talking, I was 10 in 1989, you know? Mm. So it was, it was the old Tandys, uh, you know, that were super expensive and super ugly and, and super bulky. You know, that, that's what I built as the first one. But then tech just kind of came easy to me from a conceptual perspective, but I still didn't, I still didn't get into it just because I like tech. Yeah. You know, so I started doing servers and workstations with Merrill Lynch years ago. And then I went on to be the very first Geek Squad agent in Chicago. Uh, I was already okay. working for Best Buy as a, as a supervisor for one of their t uh, tech benches. And this was just part time because I had the chops elsewhere, right? I had been in technology since I was, you know, like four feet high. But they asked me if I would consider doing this. And I'm like, sure, wh whatever, you know, you're going to give me a free car. You know, I just, I was young. I was 22, right. Not making much money at the time. It was like a pay raise going from part-time, uh, you know, into full-time at Best Buy. I was only there for the discount, by the way. That's the only reason I started working at Best Buy. <laughs> Did they still give a discount? Cause most people now just go into Best Buy, see what they like, and then go online and buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. I, I don't know if they do anymore. I mean, cause again, this was like 2003, right? So right. at that point it was awesome because I, I was, I was a project manager elsewhere and the discount was you get cost best buys cost plus 5%. Right. When it came to That's high okay. markup items, I know, right. You know, like the microphones we, we've got going on right now, those things are marked up like a hundred percent, you know? You know, so it'd be huge discounts or, or all the home theater stuff. Cause I, I was always big into movies and actually setting things up in my home to try to sound like a movie theater. It's just the way I unwind at night, which by the way, right? Hustle culture. They always say you like, get your ass in a book and all these other things. Like, you know, my biggest thing, dude, that I love to do still to this day is just pop on Netflix at night, something, you know, or HBO. It doesn't matter for the last hour I'm awake. It's really the only thing still that shuts down my brain. I, you and I are from the same elk. We'll get to that part of this yeah. in our conversation here. I want to I want to put a pin in that and get back to it. So wait, so working in the Geek Squad in the tech space, yeah, um, you're getting a familiarity with this. Okay, so there's two areas you can go, and you're obviously you're very involved with the technology piece. But to how did we get? How did we bridge this to the security side of this, and specifically cybersecurity, um, which is so important in every aspect of every aspect of business today, which definitely probably got like, a, oh, maybe I really need that. And now everyone recognizes I can't live without it. Yeah, you got it. It's getting to that point. You're right. There's still a lot of pushback on this because it's still an education factor from what I see across the marketplace. You know, and it's 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 still at the point to where most don't actually invest into it until they've had some yeah. sort of breach, some sort of financial loss. You know, like the most recent one was a client that came back to me after three years. They had $1.6 million in just hard cash in a, mm -hmm. in a wire transfer fraud that, that they ended up getting the account details from phishing, right? Just, just snuffed it right out of an email from a human being. And I'm, I'm giving you that story specifically because the human aspect of it is really the biggest piece to cyber, period, right? It, it's You can put all these these stopgap measures in place if somebody still clicks on a bad link you know and still opens the the door for someone it doesn't matter what you have in place at yeah. that point it, it, then right. it becomes incident response and, and reach management everything out you know put the fire out kind of a thing but i did that so when i was working part-time at best buy right before geek squad i was working just prior to that i was working my big thing was a branch rollout for merrill lynch that's mm -hmm. where I got involved in cybersecurity because I, I deployed, it was 15,000 servers and 120,000 computers across yeah. the United States in the enterprise space. And I started reading because, you know, it was like step-by-step -step manuals. It was great. But then I started finding pinholes in the process and the configurations that they had and then bringing those up and saying, like, it seems pretty simple to fix. So there wasn't any real training I had in cybersecurity at that point, except being in the thick of things for this huge branch office rollout for Merrill Lynch. Yeah, noticing what, what was happening and how they had issues going back and forth between the communications. I love that. By the way, I'm a, I am a former 
child of Mother Merrill. I worked for Merrill for a really? very long time. Yes, and in New York City. Uh, okay, so you have this expertise, and then obviously at some point or another, you've also now you're combining all these different pieces together from your own training, your passion for for safety. And, and yeah. any way you want to look at this, I mean, that's really what it, at the end that's of the, the day, root of it. you got it, man. You're, you're you trying to make sure that things are safe. And, 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 and I, I want to go back to what I was saying before. I, I think it is a need uh, to, you need to get ahead of the fisher, the scammer, the, the, what, what, what's the other one they call the catfisher that's going in, in some aspects of different business, but the amount of risk that's being digitally uh, communicated across the globe every single day. Uh, it, it's it's no different than like, you know, I, I used to laugh when you remember the days when you'd call up to order something on the phone and then you would have to orally give out your your credit card number to somebody sure. on the other end. Or I even mean, a the, plane ticket. That was the only way you could buy a plane ticket. Yeah, exactly. You had to call yep. and give a credit card over the phone. I'm like, you know, someone could either be recording this, writing down the number and just going elsewhere. And between the time we do it, it always amazed me. And there's so much that we can do to protect all of this. So that's in your DNA of helping companies do this. Let's let's jump a, jump ahead. You've been saving companies lots of money helping to do that. Can you explain exactly how you're saving them the money and how you're actually p- in putting in the processes, the systems, the the way to think or even maybe even the education that's needed to help these organizations really thrive? Yeah, you got it. I can give you a couple of examples. So one is the the one I just mentioned, right? The 1.6 million that was that was just snuffed right out of, out of a bank account because of a wire transfer incident. That that was a client that we had three years ago. They hired a it was a, a family member, right? And, and they're like, you know what? We're just going to have our family member do this, you know, because they they just got out of school. For all this, I'm like, you know what? We could we could co manage this with you. I'm all for that, man. Because dude, my favorite demographic, no joke, is 18 to 30 year olds. Right. Because I, I think when, when you're 18, right, there's so much pressure that society has on you. I mean, we, we could go down a rabbit hole with with student debt and all that. But beyond that, it's like when you're 18, you're expected to know what you're going to do for the next 50 years of your life. And at the same time, now you're a legal adult and you have no restrictions on you whatsoever. You have all this freedom. It's just a really crazy time in, in any individual's yeah. life. Right. When you turn 18. You know, so that was the situation with this. Like, it's like, okay, they decided to go to school for IT, not even cybersecurity, but networking, all that. I'm like, okay, so we'll we'll help him. Let's let's raise him up. You know what? He'll be like our our feet on the street, so to speak. And said, no, we're just gonna have him. Like, okay, that's fine. And we had had conversations. This was three years ago around all the measures that have to be put in place. You know, because mm-hmm. even three years ago, things are way different than what they are right now from a oh. cybersecurity perspective. You know, we used to have maybe we call them layers, right? In a stack that produces our services. There used to be four or five. Now we have 34, which is industry leading. Like, like, because it's, we call them attack vectors. It's just different ways that hackers can get in. All of them have to be covered. Yeah. Yeah. So now there's 34 different tools or or very specific procedures from a human monitoring whatever that go into the cyber offering that we have now to help protect all these things. Got Back it. then, it might have been four or five. So three years later, fast forward, we get a phone call. It's like, hey, remember us? We just had $1.6 million stolen you know, mm-hmm. in this incident. So then it's like, at that point, you know, I got to hate, hate. Do we swear on the show? I don't know. Because yeah, you can so fucking swear as much as you'd like. <laughs> Good. I, dude, I, I hate fucking engineers, right? And this goes out to my industry, too, because they're so fucking condescending, you know, in situations like that. Like the I told you so's. You know, that has no place in any of this, right? Because it's compassion. How does that help you move forward? I think I did an episode on this or something like that on my own show. Like, how does saying that or feeling that or expressing that or inter- engaging with somebody like that help the situation at all? You know, I might be a little bit of an inspirational speaker too, right? Because just if you be. move you could past be. that and actually get, I know, I could be maybe just a, a little bit. But in this, you know, because it you have the, the cable guy come out to your house, right? And that's it. It's like, well, you should have done this. It's like, fuck you. You know, it's like, whatever. I'm calling you to help me. And that that was this phone call from these individuals mm-hmm. you know, to, to where they're like, you know, I, I need help. I'm like, I got you. I understand this happens. And and then I go out because I don't, I don't typically go out and meet with clients because I took the company public. My role as a CEO now is, you know, capital raise, mergers and acquisitions, uh, public interviews, you know, all of that. But I went out and met with them because they were a, a client of old. And he's sitting there and they're saying, it's like, man, you told us about all this stuff three years ago. And, and in that moment, that was like the perfect 
could have been I told you so moment, right? And I want this to encourage everybody that's listening to right now because my response was quite simply, you know what? That's all in the past. Yeah. All I'm concerned about right now is getting you back up and running so that you can move forward. Here's what and, you and need right now. I, I love this. And by the way, I think there's there's an ego aspect huge to that yeah. to that to that engineer that gives you the hey I, i'm let make it clear you might be the smartest person in the room nobody needs to know that you are um what you need to actually do is understand how you can help them and what i, what I call this in the currency of connection the currency is help and and that's exactly they're coming to you and they've just been they've been for all intents and purposes raped from over a million yeah, dollars you got it and bent the, over and the, up the ass yeah and it, it is so awful and so frustrating that they're not looking for an I told you so. And nobody is. And what that does, by the way, is you establish a relationship for a long time. But it also is the next time that they're out and they're telling this story to somebody. Because trust me, everyone always talks about the story where you got burnt in a certain way. Someone yeah. else is like, well, who did you use to protect this? And it's a great phenomenal business uh, sale point of view. And if you burnt them and gave them that attitude, they're never going to share that story because they're going to walk away. So kudos yeah to you, you got it but you're right too and many people do that too many people do that the way you described so it. many especially in my industry too man and it, it, it it's something that really grinds my gears i don't use that phrase often but that's if that applies it most definitely applies to this uh, i mean we we started down this talking about money right but yeah. and how i've saved uh, all these corporations uh, these dollars right because this was 1.6 million you know fast forward to the end of the story with the help of the secret service and the fbi we were able to help recover half of that you know, so th so they still lost eight hundred thousand, but then we saved them eight hundred thousand as well. You know, totally. and and at that point it didn't matter because it's like they understand moving, and they're like, how much is it going to cost? You know, moving forward, I'm like, well, it, you know, the the price for what you need. You know, they were like a ten million dollar company, something like that in revenue. For what you need, it's around three hundred thousand dollars a year. You mm -hmm. know, they're like, whoo, you know that that's that's pretty expensive. I'm like, it's like three percent. You know, which is pretty good from a cybersecurity perspective. It really is when you look at it that way. And they're like, that's a lot. I'm like, it's a hell of a lot cheaper than $1.6 million. Yeah. <laughs> and or, then, or, that's, or that's where the, the balance. Yeah, I was just going to say, or the future uh, issue that they face, which if they continue to grow and develop and become a 20 or 50 or whatever million dollar company, that yeah. number of what they're going to lose becomes a bigger number and your cost is is significant. So you got it. it you got it. If you get to that. I'm still trying to come up with a great analogy, right, on how things change because something like this, I understand and I put myself in the shoes of the people that get breach or even better, the ones that have not. And they're thinking, wow, I hear about cyber all, all over the place, right? I see it on the news. I even see Rick Jordan on the news talking about these breaches. However, I, I just don't think it's going to hit me or, you know, it is a lot of money. You know, I hate to do this. You know, it, it's almost the only thing I can think of is it's like, it's a horrible analogy, but it's like car insurance, right? And I remember the transition to where it became law, where you had to have car insurance on your vehicle in order to drive, right? At least a basic liability level, because it wasn't all that way at one point, right? Well, or there had I, to be I'm collision you... coverage because you do it, do it. What yeah, do you have? I, I, no, here, I was going right? to give you the analogy. <laughs> and since you're a movie guy, I think you'll appreciate this. Uh, did you see the awesome. movie Avalon? Remember the movie Avalon? Oh, yeah. A long time ago. Yep. OK, so good family. America, com uh, generational movie for those who haven't seen it. And there was a big success in the in the 60s of these guys put together. Ironically, as we go back to the Best Buy analogy, yep. it was actually an appliance company and they invested all this money. And where did they cut to make the things that they needed? They cut fire insurance. They yeah. cut it. And by, <laughs> and by the way, people do this Pe and, and and people do this because the the cost and the premiums are very high and they're looking at, oh, I'm not going to get a fire. This place isn't going to burn it down. Out of all the things you have to think about, that's the analogy. The the Somebody stealing the money from you and not utilizing cybersecurity appropriately in your company is like not having fire insurance in your home and all of a sudden everything goes up in smoke and you lose everything. Yeah, that's that's the it. analogy. There you go. You, could, you feel free to put that on your website. Well, thanks. I appreciate <laughs> that, man. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. This situation I'm describing with the 1.6 million, 100% was avoidable yeah. because of how it happened. You know, it, and the, just the measures that would have been in place out of those 34, right, that, that reach out and puts in place, it, this one would have been prevented 100%, no problem. 
Now, there's still this is the reality of cybersecurity, just like a vehicle accident, right? Because you you can't control everything, but you still always have a chance of being breached, even if you're doing everything right. Because this is just ever changing. The only thing afterwards is because you have these measures in place already, you can survive it, right? Yeah. To where you you can maybe recover 100% of something like this. And that that gets into incident response, which in downtime, right? And I know we're industry leading in this too, because I think our longest, everyone talks about ransomware, our longest time, one of our clients, because our clients get hit, dude, right? They, they do, they still do. Even with everything that we do so well, they'll still get hit because it's still like an active attack. This just happens, right? But since everything that, that we do is ready to roll for them for that incident response, because it's not just the prevention anymore. It's not like throwing antivirus and saying I'm I'm safe, right? Or throwing like identity monitoring, right? If you're a LifeLock customer or something like that and saying, okay, cool, my stuff's safe because LifeLock's monitoring it. Well, no, they're just going to tell you when you get hit. That's all that yes. it is, right? So after the fact, the longest we've had a client down is two hours. That's it. The shortest being three minutes. Yeah, you know, like yeah. complete lockdown ransomware to get them back. Two hours is nothing. It's like Twitch as we started the conversation with, right? That's super fast. It's really blazing fast. But this 1.6 million, right? That saved them 800,000, you know, recovered that. There's other, there's scenarios like that all across the board. But I hope that this catches on faster. And I think the insurance industry coming back to that is going to help us to yeah, help, I agree uh, with you. meaning us collectively as the American public, not me as a company, but because I'm saying I'm out here to help protect you. But as the American public, the insurance industry is starting to mandate even not just cyber liability, but general liability, professional liability. They're starting to mandate cyber controls be in place because they can see that as a risk factor. Yeah, I love it. And, and, and uh, we, we've obviously jumped around here <laughs> going from from you driving uh, i do that a, i squirrel no no but it's good yeah, no yeah. no no yeah. for our listeners they get it i'm, I'm i'll summarize pretty effectively here right so <laughs> we started off <laughs> Thanks, in the geek Lou. squad car we created our own little business and he hinted to us obviously the, the business has also gone public he's now doing uh all the stuff for the fundraising being a ceo being a spokesperson you know hanging out in chicago and going to news nation because it's cool and a real cool studios and everything um yeah, but all yeah. that and 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 I've also noticed we'll get to this in a bit. He's he's got a hell of a voice, by the way. So obviously, I was curious. How this must have led to podcasting as well. If you haven't picked that up, listeners, here's the question: You wear a lot of hats, Rick, a lot of them, and you were in the nooks and crannies from a very young age, and obviously now you're managing and leading an organization, which is pretty freaking awesome, by the way. It's like kind of a crazy Thank ride. You. Which hat do you like wearing most? Dude, I, I, you probably picked up the passion when I started talking about the the condescending engineers, right? <laughs> and then encouraging it, and then encouraging everybody to be like, "Hey, this is how you should approach people." I love nothing more than being in front of somebody and help getting somebody move from A to B, mm-hmm. you know, and especially when it's like masses, right? So if I'm on a stage in front of a couple thousand people. And seeing, you know, because I know that I can communicate well, and I know that in that space, those individuals are going to hear something that they've never heard before, and they'll be able to take that and apply it to their life and maybe get out of poverty, right? Maybe get out of this, this SBA, Small Business Administration statistic that the average business owner makes only $60,000 a year take home. You know, that to me is ridiculous, you know? So it's like there, there's better things that you can do. And that's why I'm here in front of you is to help you. It's a uh, cyber cyber is great, man. I mean, it's awesome. Right. But when, when somebody calls and said like Fox five in DC calls up and says, you know, like if there's a breach or if there's like Elon Musk that, that find all finds all these bots and there's a whistleblower with, tw- with the Twitter deal. Right. Yeah. And they call up and say, Hey, I need Rick to break this down for America. That's what I love doing. It is just explaining this and how this affects you as a person, as a human, and how you can can protect yourself or even better, right? How you can utilize whatever I'm talking about today, if it's mindset, if it's entrepreneurship, if it's cybersecurity, if it's just business, if it's relationships, whatever, getting you from where you're at now to even just the very next step, getting you unstuck. Proud Loud listeners, now you know why he's on the program and why he thrives each and every day because he hits all the the DNA points of what we look for in those that thrive in our lives and the businesses and their passions. And he's living it every day, which is awesome. Um, I, I want to do this because I, I you, you hinted to it, but um, 
I want to want to maybe even dive in more and ask the question more appropriately. You've been thriving in your career um, in in me in the media space in all these different aspects, wearing a black t shirt the entire time you're doing it, which makes it even more amazing. Rick, I'll though, struggle. we all have those. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Rick, we all have those days when we're not quite kicking on all cylinders and we're a little off our game. Rick Jordan, when you have trouble thriving, what practice do you seek or maybe which individual do you seek out to get yourself back on the thriving track? That's a good perspective, man, and a, an amazing question. Uh, I've been articulating it this way over the past several months because it's a it's a pretty standard question. Like, like what do you do when you're down? Because I'm human, right? Just like everybody else. And it, my... Uh, if I were to call it like a not me theme, my not me theme is frustration. Because when, when everybody, I'm always being able to find the path forward in anything, right? And that's why it, people love being around me. It's just fact because they'll, they'll be like, hey, Rick, what do we do? I'm like, cool. Well, we're going to do this. You know, and they're like, oh, okay. Why didn't I see that? I'm like, well, you did. You just didn't realize. And then it's a cool coaching moment. But that's why they like being around me. But there's moments when I'm frustrated, man. And it's because I do hit the wall or I do feel like a temporary defeat. Uh, and in those moments, I've started to reframe that for myself. And it's always been this. And it's one phrase that I, that I tell myself when I like, God, I'm frustrated, right? And it takes a little bit of self-awareness to recognize that you're in this spot too. And that's something that everybody listening will have to work to start to recognize these things. But once you do, for me anyways, when I read, it's like, oh, I'm frustrated. It's like, oh, okay. Then it's Rick, you're thinking too small. That's the biggest thing that I tell myself when I get frustrated, because if it's whatever it is that I'm working at, whatever I feel like temporary defeat at, I feel that it was meant to whatever that project was, whatever that that step was, was meant to be, or the vision even of itself is meant to be bigger than whatever that thing is that caused the frustration. So now it's, you know, and so I, I did this even with a capital raise, right? It, you know, because we were looking, it's like, oh, okay, we, we launched our, our mini IPO under Regulation A, and originally it was like, okay, we're going to go for $2 million. I'm like, no, you know, in that case, and we had, we had so much trouble, dude, so much trouble trying to raise like that amount. And in the process, I was like, like, what is the deal here? It's like, because I kept talking around to people. It's like, you know what, if you're looking like for 50, it'd be no problem. You know, so in that moment, this was just a thing I learned this year to reframe, right? It's like, okay, I'm thinking too small. And that's whether it's Dude, if it's podcasts, if it's Instagram, it's, if it's personal brand, if it's the business, if it's, if it's operations, if it's a capital raise and something is frustrating, it's probably just because you're thinking too small and yeah, you I might be that. meant for something bigger in that moment. I love that. Yeah. But for the record, it's easier to raise 50 million than it is five. It is. <laughs> Absolutely. It is. It's a, you're got, dealing with a different audience. It's, I know. It's just I've got thing. no less than eight people that are individually working on 50 million from different avenues right now. And they all look great. Yeah. You know, so it could come in to be where it's like 400 million that comes in. And that seems even easier now than 50. No joke. It's so crazy, right? Rick, let's do the admin part of the show. Share yeah. with the listeners all the places people can find you, websites, URLs, all those fun things. We will put it in the show notes, but it always gets more engagement when they hear it from you. That's cool. Instagram is by far my biggest platform from a personal brand. It's at Mr. Rick Jordan. Uh, LinkedIn, you can just search me under Rick Jordan. That's that's more of the corporate side where you get cybersecurity information. There's a lot more mindset stuff going on there nowadays too. But I would love uh, to have everyone come and just listen to my podcast and just search my name in Apple and Spotify, whatever. I'll pop up right away. Or you know what? Google me because I take up the whole first page and everything's right there. <laughs> <laughs> he really did, by the way. <laughs> if you got to check it out. And with the name, by the way, with the name like Rick Jordan, because there's probably a lot of Rick Jordans. Did a good job here. You cut you're, you're covered <laughs> the search engine. You're beating the algorithm. Those gosh darn cyber. You know what that is? And this is everyone asks, like, how do I how did I do it? You know, for real. And the, this is good for everybody listening. It really is. I I have paid zero dollars for SEO. No joke. You know, what I have done is I've done a lot of highly leveraged activities with backlinks that have just been that way and, and TV and, and guesting on podcasts have been what has done that to yeah. the point to where Google's even given me the panel. Cause I have so much searches for my name, you know, which is being edited. Cause I'm not 64, by the way, it might've been, I was going to say, point, why, why do they someone think just you're so old? this week? Yeah. I have <laughs> no enough. idea. I'm not... <laughs> they got you the see, links, right? You know, that's good. But it... Rick, Rick, try, try dealing with the search engine when uh, two thirds of a very famous actor's name is your full name. Anyway, yeah. yep. <laughs> <That's rude. laughs> hence, the, hence thrive loud. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in another episode. Okay. Uh, 
permission to go down Fun Street with me, my friend. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. This is going to be fun. Having fun. Oh, of course we have. And and I want to break this into two pieces because I gave you a heads up at the top of the episode. So that gave you a little bit of time to think. But I also want to chop it into two pieces. If you could share with the listeners, maybe what's your most rewatchable movie? Listeners need to know when he wants to kick back, he shares and watches a movie. We talked about that with his tech stuff. Relax, right? So is there a movie that if it's on, you're in no matter what? Uh, you know, it's the it's the brain shutting. I love epics, right? And if it's on, <laughs> it's, just, it's somewhat embarrassing to talk about because it, it's just something that I like going back to if I need to t- shut my mind off. Thor Ragnarok. That's a good like, one. That's a funny one, too. That's, a, it, that's that why one. I like it. Yeah. It's probably one of the be- best ones that I've seen out there in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you know. But otherwise, it would be, you know, Star Wars I could watch any day. Yeah. And there's a lot of history with that, you know, or, or Star Trek. I like them both equally right but star trek kind of goes back to my dad because prior to him passing that's a a memory that i have of him is when next generation was literally like being played episodically week by week that's what he and i would watch when i was you know 9 10 11 12 years old just he and i that's awesome uh my favorite thing about ragnarok was the the fight scene between hulk and uh and Thor inside, <laughs> like they're in their drinking kingdom when they're champions. I know, called, yeah. Like, they're the talking about a set of roommates. <laughs> I love it. Uh, He's a friend from work. <laughs> <laughs> the best life. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, let's flip this now to the other half of this. Okay, we've had a lot of these, talk about episodic, we've had a lot of these series or streaming series that are out there. Is there one that you're hooked on and that you like more than another? You know what I go back to a lot, and I just got back into it again, it was Breaking Bad. And it's uh, I know everybody loves that, right? And it's a, it, it's great, but it's so well written, you know. And that's the thing because I love serial plots. That that's something that gets me hooked to where there's an arc that spans an entire season or an entire show that you can continuously build upon. It's how my brain works, right? So the the episodic stuff, like everybody loves Friends. I love Friends too, you know, the the sitcom. Yeah, but it's the story is start and stop. There's not much of a story arc between episodes. Right. It, it's very episodic. But when there's that that serial plot that happens, that's one reason I really like Breaking Bad. That's yeah. another one I can throw on at night and just unwind. So that was some of the best television for us. And, and it, it right changed. On. It also changed um, the way we watch television because of yeah. the uniqueness of the channel it was on and then providing it in Netflix. And it created a whole boom of what it, what got it should it. be. All right. So we're going to do the speed round here, Rick. I know you can handle it. You're a pretty apt and smart dude, let alone the fact that, you know, he likes scotch. We're going to talk about that in a minute. I'm going to ask you a question. I want the first thing that comes to your mind, things that lift you up, motivate you, make you feel good. Basically, they make you thrive. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Of late, a song that you love to listen to, or maybe one that's your jam. Oh, wow. Um, Everything or Nothing at All by Willie Echo. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Favorite food. That is not a dessert. That is not a dessert. Wow, steak all the way. Okay. Well, how do you like your steak? What's your what's your steak? Choice? Medium rare. Medium rare. Uh, okay. Oh, geez. It, if I can get it, and you you know, a five wagyu is by far the best. You know, a wow. fillet. Yeah, but otherwise a bone and fillet, just a regular bone and fillet. A Capital Grill. You know, Capital Grill usually has those yeah. in from a local butcher. It's pretty great. Yeah. Favorite dessert. Dessert. Oh, geez, that would be tiramisu. Okay. An activity you wish you did more of. Wow. Uh, more audiobooks. You know, I, I tie those to my workouts. It's it's otherwise hard to fit those in because that's how I consume more information. But when I work out four to five times a week, I will listen to audiobooks. It's a good meditation time. I, like but I wish I had more time to do that. An activity you wish you did less of. Oh, geez. Wow. Uh, probably... <laughs> I don't know. What would I want less in my life right now? Those you know, annoying engineers. <laughs> yeah. You know what it is? Okay. I was, I've just been thinking about this actually, because it, it, it's interesting and I've been trying to put this in place using my phone right away, right in, in the mornings, like immediately, because I, I do have a morning routine. Anybody who ends up following me will find this out. I always eat breakfast right away when I get up and then I'll work out. You know, but during my breakfast, I've typically used that to catch up with times for for news, you know, and open email, or whatever. But the last three weeks, it's been sporadic, but I've been not doing that. And I love those mornings because I'm just able to sit there and, and, and think like yeah. no, no external stimuli. That's what I wish I was doing less of still. Rick Jordan, if I could snap my fingers, you could be anywhere in the world. 
Where are you? Oh, geez. I would say Italy right now. Mm. I've got to say, aside from being right here, like right in the moment where I get a lot of those people. Yeah. You know, but you live in Chicago. I live just outside of New York. We we need to get in better geographies when we're we in. We do. So exactly. Italy, yeah. Italy definitely is the one I I, I, I think we hear yeah. the most, which is good. Okay. Last bonus question here uh, for those who can go check him out on all his links. And obviously you can see him on social. He highlights that he's a Scotch fan. Okay. Um, what is your favorite brand of scotch? Which is the one, and, and I'm not talking like the the top of the shelf. We're breaking, you know, the bank, and it's the highest, you know, yeah. one you can ever find. I want the one that's like your go to. Like this is the one that type you like the most. Yep, the everyday would be Macallan, and I love yeah. it too because the range spans the from the top top shelf all the way down to my everyday, which would be Macallan Twelve. Oh, you know, yeah. I mean, you can even get Macallan Twelve double cask at Costco now, right? It's like seventy bucks at Costco. But I, I would suggest anybody listening, don't spend less than 50 bucks on a bottle of scotch because you, know, you can get down and they just become horrible and they get, you know, the every day is maybe 60, 70 bucks. Something like that is a good price range. But I had I had McAllen exceptional cask just a couple of weeks ago for the first time. It's an eight thousand dollar bottle. It was a it was a, a of all places, a bar in a Westin hotel that I was staying at in New Jersey. I know, oh, blew my mind. Yeah. Oh, I know the mind. Westin. I know where you were. I know. I know exactly. You're in Jersey City at the one that overlooks yep. the down part. I know exactly. That's a nice. That is yep. a nice bar. That's like a really fancy schmancy kind of place. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I was mind blown that that was up there too. And plus, they were trying to get rid of it, which blew my mind because they're like, yeah, whatever. It's like to, they rang it up as a McAllen 15, so it was twenty three dollars. When that no joke is like a fifteen hundred dollar glass because the bottle is eight grand. I paid twelve. Like I'll have two more, please. (laughs) And if I didn't, can I get the bottle to go? I know, right? Exactly. (laughs) But it was it's those moments that make life for real. I love it, Rick Jordan. uh, Check him out. All in podcast. Everywhere he's gone in his business, he's kicking butt every single day. And uh, I'm sure you'll see him on whenever there's a cyber breakout. He's probably going to be on TV telling you about it pleasure to have you on thrive loud my friend keep doing what you're doing inspiring people and mixing all your passions together uh, including that scotchman i'd raise one to you right now if i had one. It's a <laughs> little early Lou. in the morning <laughs> yeah you're amazing my man i appreciate you you got it and to all the listeners out there thank you for joining us and until next time keep moving onward and upward and remember be brief be bright be gone You've been listening to Thrive Loud with your host, Lou Diamond. Check us out on the web at thriveloud.com and follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook at Thrive Loud. And check us out on the Good Pods app at Thrive Loud, where you can follow, listen, and connect directly to Lou and all of the Thrive Loud episodes. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.